interested in what those things aren't going to work. Um, and, and we know now that they've come a long way. Um, they used to be for patients who just had no hearing whatsoever. And um, you'll see a little bit today that, that that has changed. It's changed a lot. Although there's been so many changes, um, adults tend to only still be referred for consideration of a cochlear implant when there's zero benefit from hearing aids. So hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that today we'll be able to give you a better feel for who's actually um, receiving implants and the kind of outcomes that we're um, getting with, with our adults. And there's so many adults who could benefit from implants who don't receive them. It's currently estimated that less than 10% of adults who qualify for cochlear implants actually receive one. It's very common for a patient to come in who, has, who hasn't used the telephone for five or 10 years. Um, and I'll ask them that and I'll think, oh, you probably should have been here five or 10 years ago. So um, we're hopeful that those um, early referrals will actually lead to approved outcomes. So why are patients being referred so late? Well, um, if you think about the last time you had a, a physical, last time I had a physical with my PCP, they didn't ask me about my hearing. They didn't say, how's your hearing? Um, and I think if, if they did, that would open the door for a lot of people to get hearing aids, to get cochlear implants, just for them to come into our doors so that we can help them with their hearing. Um, so there's really not good hearing screening services for adults. Um, there's a lack of familiarity of cochlear implant candidacy requirements amongst so many populations, among primary care doctors, amongst audiologists, amongst hearing aid dispensers, among the general population. So um, there's also very poor communication between cochlear implant clinics between and hearing aid dispensers, as well as between the clinics and diagnostic audiologists. So that's part of what I'm doing today is just trying to update people about that information. What adds to the confusion is um, we could have three clinics in Ann Arbor, even though we don't, we only have one, but if we hypothetically had three clinics that provided implants in Ann Arbor, each of them could have their own procedures that they use, their own protocols, and they might have different criteria for when they'll recommend an implant. So there's greatly variable indications across um, all the different clinics. And that, that leads to lack of clearly defined care pathways. So if someone identifies a cochlear implant candidate, where do they send them? And importantly, which this will deal with today, is there's lack of clear referral guidelines for audiologists and dispensers who don't work with cochlear implants. So that's the purpose of, of today. And in our practice, we provide a, a lot of outreach and professionals would often come up to me after a talk and say, but how do I know when I should refer? And I really didn't have a good, strong answer. And previously, we weren't really sure what to say. So we, we performed a study that I'm going to talk to you about today. But let's talk about how far implants have come. Um, when they were first introduced, uh, we talked about this, that they were required to be bilaterally profound, have no measurable hearing, no benefit from amplification. And today, candidacy looks much different. Uh, babies can receive a cochlear implant as young as nine months of age, and there's a lot of clinics implanting babies sooner than that. Uh, we can implant adults, uh, actually, and children uh, as young as five years of age who have single-sided deafness or asymmetric hearing loss. We can implant patients with normal low frequency hearing with a hybrid or an EAS device. And we can implant patients who score up to 59% on sentences in their best aided condition. And that's a traditional candidate. So um, we're implanting people that have more hearing than that. There have been numerous technological advances. Cochlear implants have off the ear and on the ear options. Patients are really excited to get these button processors that stick to the, the top of their ear and don't hang on the side of their ear. We have bimodal streaming, so they can use a microphone that will send the sound to their hearing aid plus their cochlear implant. There are apps where they can um, control the device's volume and the program number. And data logging is tremendous for us. Um, you all have had it in hearing aids for a long time, but we only recently got it in cochlear implants and it's been life changing for our management. Of, of children and adults. Um, for some reason, my pictures are not showing on, on here, the audiograms that I have. Let me see if they're, they seem to have disappeared on me. Um, hold on one second. I'm gonna stop sharing. 
Let's see what happened with my... pictures because they add a lot to the the talk if we have these pictures in here give me one second Okay, I'm going to try again. All right, so this one, there's a few more pictures in here. So um, we talked about that, and now we can actually see the pictures of, let's see if I share it, there we go of an off the ear and the on the ear option. So we have these small button devices that are off the ear. We've got this bimodal streaming where we can stream simultaneously to the implant and the hearing aid. We've got these great apps where people can just take out their phone. And we've got this data logging where we can tell um, how long the patient has used the device, which is really helpful for children. And then there's improved um, electrode arrays and surgical techniques for hearing preservation. So if we look at the traditional FDA indications for cochlear implants, um, they vary for the different manufacturers, but in general, most clinics and most insurance companies will use the following indications as a guideline for the traditional candidates. And that would be a bilateral moderate to profound sensory neural hearing loss with scores less than 60% on open set sentences in the best aided condition. So here we see that for the traditional candidates. So we have the moderate, severe to profound, right? And previously when we were down in this profound area, we would really focus on this area of the audiogram because patients would tend to only have hearing sort of a corner audiogram in the bottom left-hand side. With children, um, they typically have a bilateral severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss with word recognition scores less than 30%. Um, and they're often tested in noise. And now with our electroacoustic devices, what we're finding is that we can go up to uh, as, as much as normal low frequency hearing. And so instead of focusing on this bottom area, what we're doing now is we're focusing on the, the top area. So if you have hearing in this top right hand, then you're probably not a candidate, but all of a sudden this entire area of the audiogram has become part of the indications or the eligibility for cochlear implants. Because the electroacoustic devices uh, include adults with normal low frequency hearing and severe to profound mid to high frequency hearing. And really what this changed was um, the, the speech recognition as well. These patients can have up to 80% word recognition in the opposite ear and up to 60% word recognition in the ear that we implanted. And that's because of based on um, all of the, of the data that was collected, we found that when a patient has a hybrid or an electroacoustic device, where the electrode array will provide information about the high frequencies, the acoustic component of the cochlear implant will provide the low frequency information. And those two things combined together provide them with better speech recognition skills than we've seen traditionally in the past. We also were recently approved for single-sided deafness. The MedL device received approval for single-sided deafness, which is defined as profound sensory neural hearing loss in one ear and normal hearing or even a mild sensory neural hearing loss in the opposite ear. Uh, for adults 18 years of age and older, they can have a CNC word score less than 5% in the ear to be implanted. So they really have to be very profound in that ear with single-sided deafness. 
Um, and for those from five to 18, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a word score that needs to be less than 5%. And individuals must have at least one month of experience wearing a cross hearing aid or other relevant device before they can be recommended for the surgical procedure in the profoundly deaf ear. At the same time, uh, the MedL device was approved for asymmetric hearing loss. So similar to the SSD, but that good ear can have slightly poorer hearing, so they can have um, a mild to moderately severe sensory neural hearing loss in the better hearing ear. And they need to have at least a 15 dB difference in the pure tone averages between the two ears. Again, they need to score less than 5% in that deafened ear. So why are we talking about referring traditional candidates today? Well, many clinics have reported an influx of SSD patients and asymmetric patients referred for an implant evaluation, but it seems as though we're really missing those traditional candidates. We're still getting those ones that haven't been able to hear anything for the past 10 years. And so centers are routinely talking about that. So standard audiometric and cochlear implant candidacy testing use very different procedures. So standard audiometrics will do, um, will utilize unaided air and bone conduction thresholds. So this is a, a typical audiogram. So we're going to see the air for the right and for the left, the bone for the right and for the left. And we're going to see the unaided word recognition down here. Um, where we get a lot of variability is, uh, at least on the audiograms that we're seeing in, that patients bring in with them, is sometimes those uh, tests will be administered live voice. Sometimes they'll be administered via recording. Sometimes they'll use NU6 words, sometimes they'll use CNCs, uh, sometimes they'll use W22s, um, but there's great variability there in terms of uh, the type of information that's being collected for standard audiometric testing. But primarily, we've got this unaided air and bone conduction and this unaided word recognition. If we look at a cochlear implant candidacy evaluation, um, we, we do some of the same things, but we also do things that are, are quite different. So um, what we'll do as part of the CI candidacy evaluation is um, we'll do unaided testing. If the hearing uh, has been tested recently, we typically won't repeat that. Um, we'll accept the audiogram from the referral source. We'll put their hearing aid through hearing aid verification. Um, and it's really important that we do that um, because a lot of times these patients are coming in and they'll tell us, I don't hear well, but uh, I haven't been back to see my hearing aid dispenser or hearing aid audiologist in about five years. And I just wanted to come here first because I don't want to go get a hearing aid if I'm going to end up being an implant candidate. And it's, it's almost should be flipped, right? Um, they should be optimizing their hearing aid uh, before they come in for the implant. Um, but we'll run verification. And the results of that verification, um, if they're not meeting targets, then what we will do is program a clinic aid that's meeting targets to do the testing with. And some people might say, yeah, but you should be using their personal aid. And if the patient feels they're going to do better with the personal aid or the clinician does, we'll use both our clinic hearing aid as well as their personal aid in our speech recognition testing. And remember, we're supposed to be looking at their best aided responses. So we really want to use a hearing aid that's been verified uh, to be meeting targets. So the testing that we'll use is um, aided speech recognition testing. We'll look at C and C monosyllabic words, AZ bio sentences that we'll administer in quiet, as well as administer in noise at either a plus five or a plus 10 signal to noise ratio. Um, in our clinic, we always use utilized a plus 10 signal to noise ratio. And um, what that means, I'll go over that in just a minute. Um, if I go back here, um, so following that verification, uh, most clinics will perform speech recognition in the right ear by itself aided, the left ear by itself aided, as well as in, in a bilateral aided condition. And wherever the patient scores the best, that's considered their best aided condition. So remember that the FDA in their indication says in the best aided condition. So first we have to determine what that is and then look to see if that score meets that best aided condition. Some additional tests that might be administered um, might include evaluations of tinnitus or uh, we might talk to them about their expectations or quality of life, hearing handicap. And all of these help in the decision of who should receive a cochlear implant. 
So let's look at some of these measures. Um, the CNC monosyllabic words, we always administer it uh, via uh, taped materials. It's usually a male speaker only, and the word is preceded by, by ready. So for example, here, um, they would hear ready goose, ready name. The ready prompt is good, especially when we're working with patients with very limited hearing, um, just so they, they can differentiate the word that uh, they need to listen for. Um, I like this test because it's a pretty straight structure um, and they can't really fill in the blanks like they can with the sentences. And it gives us a, a good feel for what they're truly hearing. And the CNC words are important because those recent clinical trials and the hybrid and the EAS devices use words to help determine candidacy. So traditionally, we've looked at scores less than 60% on sentences, but now with more recent devices and with the hybrid and EAS, they're basing candidacy on a word score. So it's important for us to utilize both of those in our test batteries. So most clinics will utilize CNC words. They'll also utilize AZ bio sentences uh, in quiet. And these are examples of the AZ bio sentences. Uh, what I like about these sentences is they'll have both male and female speakers, which is sort of more truly representative of, of what people will hear in their environments. They're a little bit more difficult than the hint sentences or the uh, earlier sentences, the CID everyday sentences that, that we used early on with, with cochlear implants. Um, and again, that noise can vary between either a plus five or a plus 10 signal to noise ratio. So, so what does that mean? Um, well, in order to replicate a more realistic listening situation, we'll present the AZ bio sentences. Um, we typically present them at zero degrees azimuth. So the patient is uh, aimed directly at the speaker and both the signal and the noise are coming uh, directly from uh, the speaker in front of the patient. If we present the signal at 60 and the noise at 50, so that the signal is 10 dB louder than the noise, that would be our plus 10 dB signal to noise ratio. If we increase the noise, but leave the signal at 60, so we're making it more difficult, adding in more noise, and we've got a signal at 60 and our noise is at 55, then our signal to noise ratio is going to be plus five dB signal to noise ratio. If you remember back to those indications, it didn't say anything about if these sentences have to be administered in quiet or in noise. And it didn't say that if they're administered in noise, what level they need to be at. And I think um, that's one of the ways that clinicians have some leeway, which is a good thing because our outcomes have gotten better. So testing has gone, gone along with that. But the downside is it, is it makes it less consistent from clinic to clinic to decide what their protocol is and if they're going to use a plus 10 or a plus 5 dB signal to noise ratio. But we do know it's important to be testing in noise because that's probably the, the most common complaint you have from your hearing aid users. Um, and it's the most common complaint we hear preoperatively from our patients. Uh, Postoperatively, our patients still complain about being able to hear in background noise. But when we have patients with limited hearing, typically they do significantly better uh, post-implant than they do pre-implant. So here's just an example of the, the AZ bio sentences, uh, which we would use the same list uh, in a plus 10 signal to noise ratio. So diagnostic audiologists and the hearing aid audiologists or hearing aid dispensers, um, we're using a little bit of different test measures. So how do you know when a patient should be referred for an implant? So the standard of care for audiometric testing is those unaided thresholds and unaided word, but not aided sentences, where for our traditional candidates, we're basing it on this sentence score. And I think that's been the biggest disconnect and the biggest confusion for referral sources is when should I refer someone for an implant? So in order to answer this question, we developed the 6060 referral guideline. And up in the top right, I've kind of kept those uh, traditional indications up there just as, as a reminder. Um, but for this study, we examined the preoperative data for 529 patients who were seen in our clinic for a cochlear implant candidacy evaluation. And when we looked at them, we looked at all of the patients that we saw, and it was, was kind of nice because it was almost 50-50 in terms of the number of candidates 
versus non-candidates. 250 of those uh, 529 patients met traditional candidacy indications and 259 of them were not candidates. And that helped us sort of develop this referral guideline. What we did is we looked at the unaided thresholds that were obtained for each year for each of these patients. And we determined the pure tone average at five, 500, 1K and 2K for the better hearing ear. And the reason we do the better hearing ear is because if we look at those indications up there, um, the candidacy indications are typically based on the best aided and the better hearing ear typically contributes more to that best aided condition. So we looked at the pure tone average of the better hearing ear. And then we also looked at the unaided monosyllabic word score of the better hearing ear. And that was challenging because uh, as I pointed out early, everyone sort of uses different scores and some are live and some are taped, but we decided to make it representative of our referral sources. So we accepted all comers on those scores. So regardless of what word test they use, if they use taped or live, live voice. And we know that a variety of presentation levels are used uh, depending upon uh, the patient's hearing loss. And so we used that best word score for their, their best ear. And one thing that we did note when we went through all of these audiograms from our referral sources is not a single referral audiogram included an indication that aided sentence recognition testing was performed. So I really do feel as though traditional audiometry um, includes traditional audiometry without the sentence recognition. And so that's what, what makes it complicated. So here we look at uh, the results that we have for our candidates. So this is now where we took all of the data for our candidates, and I'm gonna explain both of these to you. So on the left in graph A here, we have the cumulative percentage data for our patients. So along this axis, we have the cumulative proportion, and we've got it divided into sort of steps of, of 10 dB. So 100% of our patients or of our candidates had a pure tone average in their better ear that fell between 30 and 120. And then as we narrow that pure tone average range down to 40 to 120, 50 to 120, our numbers go down. So what we saw was when we wanted to define where do about do where do most of our traditional candidates fall, we found that more than 90% of them had one that was 60 dB or higher in their better ear for their pure tone average. So we found that patients with a better ear pure tone average greater than 60 dB will likely be a candidate for a cochlear implant. Next, we looked at the best unaided word recognition score of these traditional candidates. So again, we have the cumulative proportion on this axis, and here we have the better ear unaided word recognition score. And we've got it here going from zero to 10 to 20 to 30. So because typically the word recognition is going to be poor and the pure tone average is gonna be high for these candidates, we see sort of the opposite trend here. So if we start at this end, 100% of them had a better ear unaided word score between zero and 90. And then as we narrow down that range, we see that um, more and more or, or fewer actually fall into those ranges. But we were again looking for that 90 percentile. And we find that 92.3% um, of our patients had a better, un, a better ear unaided word recognition score that was 60% or less. And if we look at all of the ones that had those scores, one of the interesting factors that jumped out at us was that 50% of these candidates demonstrated an unaided score um, that was really low, um, that was between, that was less than 20%. And that tells us that probably those patients have had poor speech recognition. And remember, this is their better ear, have had poor speech recognition for quite some time. Um, and so we have some that are out here that are still candidates but the vast majority of them had that score that was less than 20%. So based on these results, we developed the 60-60 referral guideline because for both the pure tone average and that better ear speech recognition, that number 60 popped out in both situations. 
and it utilizes measures routinely collected by the non-implant audiologists or hearing aid dispensers, and it helps determine if a patient should be referred for a cochlear implant candidacy evaluations. So the 6060 is pretty simple. It states that a, rec uh, a recommendation that patients should be referred for a cochlear implant candidacy evaluation if they have a pure tone average in their better hearing ear that's greater than or equal to 60 dB and an unaided speech recognition score in their better hearing ear that is less than or equal to 60%. So again, um, we like to use these measures because, uh, because they're routinely collected and they, they make sense when you, they're considered along with the FDA indications that consider audiometrics as well as speech recognition, even though they're not the same speech recognition test materials. So how well does it work? Well, in our sample, as you saw, uh, more than 90% of patients who qualified for an implant met these two indications. If we look at the hit rate, we looked at 415 patients. So this is where those non-candidates come in because if we only had candidates, um, then we wouldn't really know, but we also wanna know how good is it at telling us about people who should not be referred. So if we're gonna look at our hit rate and our miss rate, um, based on 450 pa 15 patients who had both data points, who had both the peer tone average and the unaided speech recognition, the 6060 referral guideline was accurate for 82% of those patients, which is a pretty good hit rate. The miss rate of 18%, some people could be worried about that and say, you know, I don't wanna send someone for a cochlear implant evaluation if they've got an almost 20% chance of not being a candidate. Um, but we felt like the, the miss rate of 18% was, was okay. And um, the reason for that, we'll, we'll go over in, in just a minute. So other people said, well, what about this as a screening tool? Can I just use this to say, when should I send them or not? So we looked at two things. Um, one was called sensitivity and the other specificity. So sensitivity takes us down this, this column right here, the candidate column. So how sensitive is it? Sensitivity tells us about the ability of the guideline to correctly classify someone as a candidate. And what we found that out of 220 candidates, the 6060 guideline or screener uh, identified 96% of those patients. We really um, didn't miss very many. In terms of specificity, um, the ability of the guideline to indicate someone is not a candidate. Again, we have, um, it's not as specific as it is sensitive, similar to our, our hit and miss rate, um, but we still feel as though that's okay. And the reason for that is, um, 18% of the patients who met the 6060 guideline did not qualify, but many of these patients returned the following year and they eventually became candidates. So this enabled us to catch them early, increasing the likelihood of a good outcome with the cochlear implant. Some of these patients were non-traditional candidates and they still received a cochlear implant. And, and by that, I mean, they might not meet that 60% uh, indication by the FDA, but recently what's happened years ago, all of the insurance companies would simply follow the FDA indications. But what we have today is that insurance companies have their own indications. They might state you have to meet the FDA indications and that's pretty straightforward. Sometimes they say, we're gonna to put together our own indications, which might be different than those of the FDA. Medicare is an example of that. Their indications are a little bit different. So sometimes they might not meet the FDA, but they might meet insurers. If they don't meet the insurer's indication, and we think they're a really good candidate, we can still ask their insurance to cover a cochlear implant. And we just need to send a, a very good letter explaining why, showing them our test results, showing them data to support why we recommend a cochlear implant for them. So some of these patients who didn't even meet the traditional indications, still received a cochlear implant, even though they were non-traditional. So some of those 18% of patients who didn't meet it still got an implant because they were still good candidates. And the flip side of that is many of these non-candidates, the ones I talked about at the beginning, who come in and haven't tried a new hearing aid in years, return to their referring audiologist, and now they're motivated to purchase new hearing aids because they came in and said, 
gosh, I, you know, I want to check this out first. And then when we tell them they're not a candidate and we say, you know, you did a lot better with a, a well-programmed hearing aid than you did with your one that hasn't been tuned for five years. We recommend you go back to your audiologist, to your hearing aid dispenser and get a new hearing aid or even get your hearing aid reprogrammed. And so we think that those patients are coming in and maybe they're seeing us and not seeing you, but we can get them back into your service so that you can make them hear better. But what about Medicare indications? Um, their indications are stricter. So we know that Medicare requires patients to have a bilateral moderate to profound sensory neural hearing loss. So their audiometric indications are the same, but they require patients to have um, a worse or a, a lower sentence recognition score of 40%. So we wanted to make sure that the 6060 would apply to the Medicare uh, beneficiaries as well. So we looked at our data and we found that 59% of 661 patients that, that we saw were 65 years of age or older. And when we broke them down, we found that uh, of those over the age of 65, 144 of them met FDA indications and 107 Met Medicare indications. So that meant that 37 of them, if they had different insurance other than Medicare, um, for example, if they had Blue Cross and maybe they weren't 65 years of age or older, maybe if they were 64 and still on a Blue Cross plan, they could have received a cochlear implant. But because they had Medicare, they were required to have a score less than 40%. But we did find that 107 or 74% of them met the Medicare candidacy indications of less than 60, uh, at less than 40%. And out of these patients, 66 of them had both word and peer tone average information available and 94% of those uh, met the 6060 guideline. So we do see with our older patients that they tend to demonstrate slightly poorer speech recognition, sometimes preoperatively as well as postoperatively than, um, than their younger cohorts. Um, but uh, we, we did find that the 6060 does work very well uh, to recommend a patient who's on Medicare for a cochlear implant. And um, one of the, the great advantages that we have with cochlear implants that um, that are not available for hearing aids just yet um, is that Medicare will cover cochlear implants as do most, most traditional insurances. So um, those Medicare beneficiaries uh, are able to receive um, improved hearing uh, from those cochlear implants. So let's look now, actually I can, can pause there to see if there's um, any questions and, and then we're gonna go on to look at a few case studies. So I'm going to stop sharing just for a moment so I can see some faces and if, if people have any questions on any of that. Nope. Okay. If you haven't, you can put them in the chat um, or you can, and, and then I can call on you later or I can just address them um, in the chat. All right. Oops. All right, so we're going to, to look at a few case studies of traditional candidates. All right, this is a patient uh, that was referred to the University of Michigan, and we see that, okay, this is a great referral. They have, uh, they meet the audiometric criteria, they have a moderate to profound sensory neural hearing loss in both ears. We see that in the terms of their speech audiometry, we've got 60% speech recognition in the left ear, 20% word recognition in the right ear. Um, unfortunately, we don't know what test was used. Um, and um, so we're looking at these scores and, and we're not certain if it's live voice or if it's recorded. But again, we took all of the scores uh, that we received from referral sources. And the reason I picked this one is because they're pretty borderline, right? Because in their better hearing ear, they're at 60%. So that might be one of the ones where you go, huh, 60% on words, maybe they're not going to meet that traditional indication. But 
I would recommend that this patient be referred because they, they do fall into that, that guideline. Um, what was interesting is this was a self-referral by a patient. Um, and actually the, the audiologist was updating the audio for new hearing aids. So the patient came in on their, their own accord and um, weren't referred uh, by their audiologist based on this testing and the scores that we see here. So we put this patient through um, a cochlear implant candidacy evaluation. And just as a reminder up here in this right box are their preoperative scores uh, of 60 and 20 or their uh, scores obtained by their uh, referral source or actually by their non-implant audiologist. And when we did the candidacy evaluation, um, we did CNC words and we used recorded words. And I think they probably did live voice. Um, so what we have here, and we used a, a clinic programmed hearing aid, we got 8% uh, in the right ear and 24% in the left. And so we see a bit of a difference there, a bit of a disconnect, but I'm gonna guess here that these were monitored live voice and ours were recorded. Then the AZ bio sentences where we know for traditional candidates, they need to score less than 60% and they're best aided. So here they're best aided would be this bilateral uh, aided condition because they both their hearing aids on and that's their highest score, which is 28%. So this patient actually was a very straightforward candidate for a cochlear implant. We ended up implanting their poor ear knowing that if we put an implant in the right ear, they could continue to use the hearing aid in their left ear um, and that they would probably have a better, better outcome, especially using both. So here is their scores for one year post-op. In their right ear, their CNC scores went up a lot. Um, Preoperatively, they went up 8% recorded and these are recorded as well to 82%. And honestly, uh, this, these scores are fairly typical of, of what we'll see uh, with cochlear implants today. Their AZ bio sentence in the right ear went from 24% up to 98% in quiet. And then when we tested them in a plus 10 signal to noise ratio with just the right implant, they scored 44%. But look what happens when we add in that hearing aid from the left ear that score in noise of a plus 10 signal to noise ratio jumped up to 79%. So we've taken someone who's really struggling in quiet with a score of 28%, and now in noise, they're scoring 79%. And in quiet, they're probably in the 90s. So um, this was a, a, a good patient uh, to show because they were so borderline in terms of the 60-60 referral. Here we have another patient. Um, that, that didn't meet the indications. They met the 60-60 referral guidelines based on the peer tone average. So for the right ear, their peer tone average ended up being 68 dB and in the left ear, 72 dB because they've got such poor low frequency or poor um, high frequency hearing. But again, we've got speech recognition that's a little bit higher than expected. So we've got 44% in the left ear and 64% in the right ear. So we put them through a candidacy evaluation. Again, here's that reminder of their preoperative scores. And here's their uh, candidacy evaluation. So in the right ear, their CNC score was 80%. So actually uh, it increased. That's different than the previous patient, right? Where it went down. But here we've got taped and taped. So these are more similar. So we have 64%, these are different lists. This is NU6 words and we use CNC words. So 64% to 80%, and then we've got 40 some percent and we've got 56%. But look at these sentence scores. When we give this patient a little bit of context, their scores go up into the 90s. Bilateral aided, I wouldn't consider that significantly different from these, um, but we've got a best aided score of 93%. But even when we test them in a plus 10 signal to noise ratio, they're still, still doing pretty well they're scoring 72%, which is about the same as that really good implant performer that we just talked about a minute ago. So we did not recommend a cochlear implant for this patient, but I really felt like this was still an excellent referral. We recommended that this patient return in a year, sooner if their hearing drops. And if it does drop, we can catch them right away, we can provide an implant, and they won't have five or 10 years of, of lost sound like so many of the patients that we're seeing. When they came in for the appointment, 
We provided them with information about their next step. We never refer to a cochlear implant as a last resort because uh, we, we really want to take our patients on this journey of improved hearing. So sometimes patients come in and they go, I'm here because this is, this is my last resort. And we're like, no, no, this is your next best step. And we're going to try to get you to improved hearing. And again, it's important for us to catch them quickly uh, for when they do become a candidate, increase, increasing the chances of a successful outcome. Now we have this patient here. Um, this is another one. So if we look at their scores, um, we can see that they've got some low frequency hearing. So someone might think either a hearing aid dispenser or an audiologist might think, hmm, I don't think they're an implant candidate. They've got pretty good low frequency hearing. But remember those indications that we talked about for hybrid and EAS. And for here, the big red flag is even though they've got this good low frequency hearing, look how horrible their speech recognition is. And this is, again, it's NU6 taped. 24% and 28%. So um, we look and they do actually meet the 60-60. We've got CNC scores of 8% and 44%. So one went down and one went up. We've got sentence scores uh, of 56 and 88. But what's interesting is this patient meets hybrid or EAS indications. So the, the hybrid um, and EAS tell us that we can put an implant and try to preserve this low frequency hearing. If they score up to 60% in the ear that we would implant and less than 80% on words in the contralateral ear. So this patient meets indications for either a hybrid or an EAS. So what we did is we, we provided a cochlear implant to this patient and we actually provided it into in their, their left ear. Again, here's their preoperative scores. We were able, this is a post-op audiogram of that left ear. So we have the left ear unaided, the right ear unaided, which hasn't changed. And then we've got their cochlear implant detection thresholds here. So what we're seeing is we've got fairly good detection with that left cochlear implant giving them better high frequency access than they're able to receive with the right hearing aid, knowing that they're gonna combine this with the speech recognition they have in the right ear. So what they ended up with, with this left cochlear implant, and likely because they had good remaining residual hearing, CNC scores went uh, from eight per, actually 44% up to 96%, and their sentences in quiet went from 88% up to 100%. And really where we see the benefit of these patients is, and I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have scores and noise here, um, is typically these patients will do much better in background noise than they've done prior to implant. But again, we see this bimodal advantage where they can use the implant in one ear they hear, with both electric and acoustic hearing and they combine it with the acoustic hearing that they get in their opposite ear hearing aid. And um, it's really life-changing for these patients. All right, we've got one more patient here. Um, these are challenging for us. We're actually seeing a lot of patients like this and we're seeing a lot of patients like this with Medicare. And the problem um, with a Medicare patient who presents with an audiogram like this is that they're not meeting the Medicare indication of bilateral moderate to profound because for example, this patient, uh, their, their thresholds don't fall into the profound range. So if this patient had Medicare, we would not be able to provide them with a cochlear implant because Medicare is so strict and Medicare won't let us ask for permission to go outside of their guidelines to provide uh, this patient with a cochlear implant. But this patient did not have Medicare, so we had a, a little bit of leeway with working with their, their insurer. Um, so what we have is a pure tone average of 65 and a pure tone average of 60, although both of their speech recognition scores uh, are less than 60% on words, NU6 uh, in tape. So we then um, verified their hearing aids. And we found that, well, you know, let's try a clinic aid as well. So this is one of the examples I talked about at the very beginning. So we used their personal amplification, and then we uh, repeated some of the testing with clinic aids. And sometimes, uh, even though we meet targets with clinic aids, 
they'll outperform with their personal aids, even when they're not meeting targets. They're used to them and they're, they're used to the sound quality. In this situation, what we found was when they had their bilateral hearing aids on, they scored 48% on AZ bio sentences and a plus 10 signal to noise ratio. And for our clinic, that's the bar. If they're less than 60% or less than 40% for Medicare patients at that AZ bio plus 10, then we typically recommend a cochlear implant. So if we'd only tested this patient with their personal aids, they would have met those indications, those FDA indications of less than 60%. But when we used clinic aids, we found that their score exceeded that. So what we recommended that they continue full-time bilateral hearing aid use, but we also recommended that they return back to their dispensing audiologist or just their hearing aid dispenser so that they could get new hearing aids and so that their hearing aids could be fine-tuned so they could try to meet targets and get them back up to that improved score. So the reason I like to show a case like this is sometimes referral sources are saying, you know what, I don't wanna send someone two hours to Ann Arbor, Michigan, maybe five hours, maybe six hours, for them to find out they're not a candidate and then they're gonna be angry at me saying, why'd you send me all the way to Ann Arbor? But I think it, it really helps the patient because we can, um, we can look at so many different things and tell them about their next best step, even when they're not a candidate. We can say, if your hearing does get worse, there is some hope and we can try to make your hearing better. Um, a lot of times, as, as indicated previously, uh, we'll just talk to them about getting their, their hearing aids uh, programmed better so that they can, they can hear better. So a few things to, to keep in mind when you're referring patients uh, for a cochlear implant. That the 6060 referral guideline, it's really focused on the traditional candidates. There's patients with better hearing um, who are being considered for cochlear implants. So if you have patients who are, are really struggling um, and they don't meet the 6060, uh, it might be good for you to contact your local implant center and ask them their opinion about the referral. And, and this will really mean a great deal to the patient. I know that, that patients are, are real appreciative. When we contact hearing aid dispensers and we, we work with, with them closely to manage the contralateral hearing aid, but they see us more as a team working together um, and they see us working really for their needs. Um, many patients receive an implant despite not meeting these traditional indications uh, if their insurer allows. This is often referred to as off-label, and these patients do well once they receive a cochlear implant. We looked at our data recently, and we found that about a third of the patients implanted last year, and, and, and we implanted about 150 patients, about a third of the adults receiving cochlear implants received them outside of the FDA guidelines with special permission from their insurance company to do so. Um, then we have these SSD and asymmetric hearing loss patients that are also receiving cochlear implants and they're doing very well. And I think what this tells us is that the FDA indications are a little bit outdated. Um, the implant manufacturers really need to bring those indications up to date to match those of clinical care and the things that um, are being provided to patients. The SSD and asymmetric tell us that we're moving away from best aided and closer to looking at the patient in general or the ear that's being treated. If we think about cataracts, they don't tell us that we need to um, have both eyes have cataracts before we can get one removed. Um, and it's, it's interesting that they tell us that we have to be deaf in both ears in order to get a cochlear implant. So um, I, I understand 30 years ago, uh, it was considered new and, and experimental, but now we know they're safe and effective. And it looks like we're really moving away from the best aided and closer to uh, discussions about um, the individual ear. So the vast majority of our patients who are receiving implants continue to use a hearing aid in the opposite ear. And that's because we're implanting patients that have a little bit more residual hearing. Uh, patients that used to come in years ago, um, honestly hadn't worn hearing aids for a long time or received zero benefit. And now our patients are, are receiving benefit, especially in the contralateral ear. And when patients come to the implant clinic and they're not a candidate, 
Um, and if they haven't been to someone in a very long time, they ask the implant program for a recommendation of where to, to obtain new hearing aids. They'll say, you know, I got my hearing aid so long ago that uh, my dispenser, my audiologist, they're not in practice any longer. Where should I go to get a hearing aid? And I would encourage all of you to, to consider um, when you work with an implant program, the referrals can go both ways. And they'll know that if, if you're referring to them and they have all these non-candidates looking for a new home, they'll likely send them back to you. Or if they're looking for a candidate who needs a hearing aid and contralateral ear because of that residual hearing, um, that those referrals can be bi-directional and, and they might refer you know, back to you as well. And it's important to know that cochlear implants are often paired with certain brands of hearing aids. So cochlear has partnered with Resound, Advanced Bionics uh, has partnered with Phonak. And these bimodal pairings enable simultaneous streaming to the cochlear implant and the hearing aid. Now, the downside is someone with a cochlear device has to have a resound hearing aid in order to get the bimodal streaming. And the same is true with Advanced Bionics and Phonak. And so in Michigan, um, there weren't that many uh, hearing aid dispensers and audiologists providing resound hearing aids for our, um, our cochlear recipients. And so a lot of our dispensers have gone to dispensing resound hearing aids so that our patients who live miles or hours away can get a hearing aid from their local dispenser rather than get them through our, our implant program. And so we partner with them so that they can provide the contralateral hearing aid and we provide the cochlear implant. So I would consider partnering with an implant center near you to co-manage the patient's hearing needs. So when you refer a patient to an implant program, it doesn't mean you're gonna lose them forever. Um, hopefully you can co-manage them. I'm just gonna finish up here with some helpful things to say or, or not to say when you discuss a cochlear implant referral with some of your patients. Um, sometimes it's, you know, patients will say, well, well why would you want to send me there? And it, it's important to tell them that you've done everything you can to maximize their hearing and that a cochlear implant might be the next step for them for improved hearing. Um, again, we talked earlier, don't, don't present implants as a last resort. It kind of sets it up for almost for failure. Um, provide them with information about cochlear implants. You can refer them to the manufacturer websites. They have phenomenal information online. Um, to the CI Clinic website that you're going to refer them to, they probably have lots of information as well. And those things will help them be informed and know what to expect during the evaluation. Uh, refer with them or review with them what will happen at the implant evaluation. We talked a little bit about that today. And that remind them that the decision about moving forward with an implant will be completely up to them. Nobody's going to push them into it. They're really just going there for information and they don't have to make a decision right then and there. They can go home and think about it for, for weeks or months or, or even years. And if the patient is hesitant proceed, to proceed and says, well, I don't want to go, maybe just ask them why and then discuss their concerns with them. And if they're concerned about cost, which is, is true of a lot of patients, inform them that cochlear implants are covered by most insurers, including Medicare and most Medicaids. And this, the implant center can check to see if their insurer covers cochlear implants before they go for an evaluation. So a lot of times patients, especially if they're coming for SSD or asymmetric hearing loss, or even for a traditional implant, they'll ask us, can you check my insurance to see if they'll cover cochlear implants? And we have an insurance specialist that will do that even before they come in for the evaluation. We don't want them driving five hours uh, to, to find out that they're a candidate, but it's not covered, which is very, very rare. So in discussion, 34% um, of the patients seen in our clinic for a cochlear implant candidacy evaluation um, demonstrated a, a, an unaided word score in their better ear that was less than 10%. So we're hoping to catch patients uh, before they get to, to be that profound or to have uh, that poor speech recognition skills. Uh, Richard Dowell from Australia had a, a great report recently where he reported that recipients' chances of a good outcome with a cochlear implant are significantly better if they receive the implant soon after onset of severe hearing loss and before they lose all auditory function. So timing is important. So it's good for you to, to refer your patients sooner rather than, than later. And remember an outcome of a, a, an evaluation that indicates someone's not a candidate, it's not a bad thing. Um, many of these patients return annually or they return to you for optimization uh, of their hearing aids. 
So based on these findings, um, we, we recommend you consider utilizing the 6060 in your practice. And we, we truly hope that this guideline will simplify the question of when should I refer a patient for a cochlear implant candidacy evaluation? All right, so thank you for, for your attention. I will stop my screen sharing. And we have just a couple of minutes left if there's, if there's any questions. Sure, Terry. Um, thank you again very much for spending an hour of your day to talk to us about this. Uh, I have a couple of quick questions uh, that I wrote down as we were going through. Um, I was under the impression that when you do an implantation that that cochlea is ruined for anything else. Uh, but now I guess there are some bimodal uh, or, or a hybrid. Discuss briefly how those work. So um, it used to be that they would that the manufacturers develop very short arrays so that they wouldn't go all the way into the cochlea. And then that would preserve that low frequency hearing. But they found that actually by developing thinner, more flexible arrays that go in longer, that they can still preserve the hearing. Not everyone, there's no guarantee uh, that there will be preservation of hearing, uh, but they're having great success with hearing preservation. Um, and sort of our guideline is if you have thresholds better than 70 dB, then we can add an acoustic component onto a sound processor so they can have both acoustic and electric stimulation. And those patients do really well. And it sounds a little bit more normal for them because they've got that acoustic information that they're used to hearing. And how would people get a hold of you if they have uh, more detailed questions? So that would be, uh, my email is, is up there. It's uh, tzwollen at hearingfirst.org. Okay. Um, I will have IHS reach out to you. The information I have for you from your bio uh, came from the International Hearing Society's uh, speaker page. So I'll have them reach out to you and see if they can update that to get your, your most latest employment. Fabulous. And I can also be reached at um, the other one's Roland at umich.edu. Yeah, and that's how I got a hold of you. Yep, that's right. That's right. Anybody else have any other questions for Terry? Well, again, thank you very much. I think we all learned a lot. It was a wonderful presentation and a nice job. Thanks so much. It was really my pleasure to be with all of you today. And I, I love partnering um, with all of you to, to help patients hear better. Excellent. Thank you. All right.